So I suppose to open the questions up, Andy, to start with. Um, what would be the scope of an integrated CBTC ETCS product set? How close are we to convergence as you see it as a product supplier? Okay. Um, well, I don't think we're talking about one product. Um, I think what we're talking about is um, a core set of commonality and then beyond that, um, the components that you plug on to customize it for the application. So the um, convergent product, I think, would have things, um, as I mentioned, I seem to be talking a lot on the video, didn't I? Um, speed and location, there's, there's a lot of software components, calculating of curves and so on, uh, breaking curves. But then um, you would then have to customize it with add-on modules for, say, uh, platform screen doors, um, uh, ATO, driverless operation, all those kinds of things would be the add-on extras. But I think um, if you can get the commonality with the core functions, that's really what you're looking for. So I suppose the question then, what would we define then as, as convergence? Is it a, um, a, a subset of the products or would we say it's you know, a, a, a flexible system that could either be compliant to the uh, European rules, or we're saying it is a system that's optimised locally on a, a particular railway. Bob, what do you think? Well, I don't know whether it's answering exactly that question, but um, I think the interesting point for me is, is for a metro operator, what would be the attraction of, of a product that was more convergent between a CBTC solution and an ERTMS solution? Um, and, and what, therefore, what would be drivers to cause people to move in that direction in terms of developing newer products, next generation of products. And, and the, the obvious um, possibility would be for a truly interoperable CBTC type system, a metro train control system, which could be procured um, at different times from different suppliers and you know, with a high degree of assurance that it would work. Um, but of course, as we know from the main line side from ERTMS development, that's not an easy process to go through to achieve that. And there are some drawbacks to it. And, and I think when you look at it objectively, Metro CBTC technologies have evolved faster than main line technologies simply because they weren't constrained by um, the requirements of interoperability. So for me, that suggests that. Um, there is perhaps a, initially a small niche market where um, truly interoperable systems will find their way into the urban environment. Um, the sort of examples being cross-city lines and lines where suburban trains run through um, common infrastructure with, with urban trains in the central areas, um, because obviously tunnels are expensive, so sharing them is, makes sense. Um, I think what, if that technology got to the point of being established, then all of a sudden you would start to see a change in the way that metros could procure um, their, their signaling and train control systems. Um, but I think it's sort of rather that way around, rather than um, looking at the, the risks and the benefits of, of convergence, it's, it's, it's what, would be the, um, what would be the drivers to cause it to happen. So, George, <laughs> so if we were then say we were segmenting the market down and if the, the, the market um, in a metro environment uh, valued some form of interoperability, point one, um, how, how, would, how do you think that would confer a benefit to a metro operator? And secondly, I think the other point that came out maybe more in the video was that uh, there is a potential for ECTS costs to come down low long term because of the volume of the market. And I suppose the second point to the question is, is cost of the equipment key to you or is it about um, getting the right implementation? Thanks, I think, well, there's a number of factors there in terms of what we'd look for um, in terms of uh, a train control system and clearly today you've heard from some of the, uh, the, the driving factors for us in terms of 
um, deployment in terms of dependability of those systems, um, as well as the performance uh, that they give us. So very much building on what uh, Bob was saying there, and that the, the sort of things that might attract us to it is where it, it does become um, a de facto facility uh, in a sort of dual operation uh, sense. The attraction for us uh, in other areas would be um, more probably on the interoperability side in some parts of our network where historically um, metros such as London Underground have, have enjoyed a level of flexibility between their lines that procuring as we tend to do today on, on a line by line type of basis tends to create uh, restrictions in what we can do. Um, but it also then drives us from, a, from another perspective in terms of cross-related things in the ability to interchange. So if there is the ability coming with interoperability to have interchangeability, then that becomes more of an attraction for us going forward. Um, so cost is important to us, certainly um, focusing in on, on the sort of unit costs for upgrading our lines. Um, but we need to have it implemented in a way that uh, provides us with a low access uh, hungry solution and one that gives us high dependability. So, Eddie, <laughs> if we ended up with a, you know, um, a CBT s standard equivalent for CBTC, could we not also have standard ways of implementing and standard ways of accepting and maybe a port over some of the other sort of things we're seeing on mainline, like modular signaling, to help with the rollout. So it's not necessarily the, the, the first off costs, it can be the implementation costs. Yes, I think that's true, but perhaps also one ought to look a bit more widely. And uh, as this seminar has progressed, I must say one of my thoughts has been, why? Because CBTC has the advantage that there is no standard. Um, that has odd effects, and it means that it's perhaps more driven by demand. And when you look at the demand, is the demand on national railways the same as that on metros? And actually the answer is yes. Um, and I think we look at the technology, and obviously there's a convergence of technology because one computer is the same, whether it's badged as CBTC or ERTMS. A taco is a taco, etc. So there's a strong drive to have a commonality there. But that's the smallest part of the problem. If I'm a passenger and I'm wanting to catch a train from Maidenhead and it's the 10 o'clock train, the fact it went at 9.58 because they regulated the service to be smooth at Oxford Circus is going to annoy me considerably. If I'm at Oxford Circus and there's a 10 minute gap in the service because the Maidenhead train actually had to be allowed to arrive on time in order for the train operating company to be paid, I'm going to be equally cheesed off. And so perhaps one of the biggest differences is the way that the railways operate. And in that, I am beginning to see a bit more of a convergence. That the idea that a railway is a whole system is becoming much more prevalent. And that goes not just from train regulation, ATO, platform edge doors, kit. It also goes wider, as you said, it goes into how to introduce the system. We heard a lot in the earlier presentations about simulation facilities. They are expensive. They have to be proved to work. Why do it three times over? One for a CPTC system, one for an ERTMS system. We heard about Tetra, classic example where a standard got tied to a technology and a solution. Surely it should be IP now. Surely we should be getting away from the idea that the radio is actually linked in directly into the system. Commissioning, passenger information, all those areas are ones where I see a, a great commonality and that's where the savings can be made. So, <laughs> Steve. <laughs> um, one of the uh, aspects uh, which come out also um, in the video was on the main line, they don't really understand the benefits that metros have really squeezed the pips out of their service to get it to perform. There's an also, uh, I think, coming out now that it's not necessarily just the unit cost of buying, it's the cost of implementing and the cost of owning the product. So how can we value that such that people can understand 
um, how to meet their business objectives and therefore make the right investment decisions, whether it be CBTC or something, a clone of ERTMS uh, in a metro environment? That's a good question. And, and sort of leading into that, I think one of the things we're seeing is that where um, railways are being developed in cities, particularly in uh, new areas, um, there, is a, there is a blurred distinction between the metro and the more urban railway. And one of the benefits of uh, a converged system is that you can operate in the metro area like a metro system, in the urban area like an urban system, with a converged um, specification such that trains can run on both if they need to. And obviously, it's an easier system to manage and maintain. But the question uh, in terms of how to value the benefits, it's very important to understand how you're going to operate your system. What is the, and sometimes called an, a concept of operations, and sometimes people think of that as a very low level of you know, how the operators interact with the system. But actually, it's about how are you actually going to move the people around. And the sort of thing that Eddie was talking about, what's important to you in terms of your passengers? And once you can actually understand, if you like, the, the business case and the, the high level requirements for your system, then to be able to translate that into the requirements for the function of the system, both operational and technical, will then lead you to be able to choose the right system. And actually, uh, as has been said, there isn't really, I mean, we, we've been looking, studying uh, ETCS level three, because ERTMS level, level two is already in operation. Actually, there is really no difference between level two and level three. The difference is in how you, uh, how you um, uh, record or, or how you monitor the train position, which is actually a function of the, the trackside system. It's not a function of ETCS. ETCS already allows the train to send back its position. And there are level three systems in, already in operation. So in a sense, all the... Uh, the ingredients are there to converge the systems technically, but to, in order to uh, realise the benefits, you need to understand how they deliver your operation that you would like to achieve. And as I say, some of the new cities that are being developed across the world where uh, particularly they're not constrained by ETCS uh, uh, compliance, if you like, in terms of the work that the notified body has to do to tick all the boxes, are actually demonstrating... Um, the ETCS can achieve uh, at, at its top level just the, the levels of performance that CBTC can achieve. So I think it's understanding the relationship between the business requirements and the functional requirements and then choosing the correct system to implement it. I suppose I'm reminded that, you know, how do you know what you don't know? And um, although you know mature uh, operators like London Underground and uh, RATP in Paris have implemented CBTC, there are metros that still don't understand CBTC, let alone the enabling uh, changes to the operations that come along with, with that ability to automate and use communications. And if we've got uh, main line operators that don't even understand metros, let alone the modern metro that is exploiting the capabilities of CBTC, is there then a case then to start thinking about standardising operations? Is it, you know, would there be a rule book to say, you know, if you're going to implement this technology, these are the ways you ought to think about doing it? Because this is how you exploit best value. Is that one to you, George? Well, it's something certainly that's, that's close to our heart in terms of if we're looking what we said earlier about the railway as a system, it's got to include the operator and it's got to include the customer. Um, and in terms of understanding how we deploy these sorts of systems, the CBTC systems or even the RTMS systems, one has to look at the way that affects the operator and the way that the railway runs. So from the perspective of, of attempting to, to come up with a solution that's a standard solution, um, if one doesn't attempt to standardise the way that you use it, then you're going to get localised variances and we can see that today happening uh, across Europe. So from that perspective certainly um, if you want to go forward and maximise as we tend to do and as you were saying earlier squeeze in the last drop out of the pip or whatever in terms of our performance then we're going to be looking for an integrated solution including the way that the operator uses it.
So Dave, if we have a, you know, a, a, a standard for whatever type of railway um, that we're looking to implement a signaling technology, and we have standard ways of implementing it to exploit best value, how do we measure that value? And how do we sort of start to justify a business case to help us make the right technology and operational decisions? Thank you. I was, I was wondering what you are going to ask me. <laughs> um, clearly, um, there's a dichotomy, isn't there, about the technology and the application. The applications do vary a lot. Um, does that mean that the technology needs to vary a lot? Not necessarily. But as you say, uh, there can be a standard way of evaluating the right technology for the right application. And of course, uh, bringing in the right concept of operations. I, I don't believe that uh, we're going to end up with identical ways of operating metros and high-speed lines um, and freight business which runs all over the place. There are really different problems, but you can take a a total system approach to evaluating the costs and the benefits, um, looking at the operation as a whole. I think that's what you've got to do. Perhaps just one comment on the, on the technical issues of uh, convergence. Um, there's been quite a lot of discussion about um, why do you need to try and converge? Um, you might also ask, why not? Um, if you look at CVTC and ETCS level three, the basic principles are the same. That um, the trains tell the, the wayside where they are, and the wayside tells the trains how fast they can go and how far they can go. Um, but in metro applications, uh, you tend to want to do more than just that. Um, you tend to want to tell the trains where to stop to pick up passengers. ETCS doesn't do that. Um, you tend to want to say how long the train should dwell. Um, so I think maybe the kind of thing we ought to be looking for is a, a common language where the, uh, the trains talk to the wayside and vice versa using the same um, fundamental terms but probably you will always have to have uh, in the higher capacity areas, if you like, uh, an ETCS plus language with the additional facilities for traffic management. Um, and maybe that's the way things could come together. Yeah, I, I can add a little bit to that. We, in recent months, we, we've studied um, the use of ATO with, with ETCS um, and demonstrated it to, to sort of understand what the, what the capabilities were and whether there were any fundamental limitations. I, I mean, this was from the context of mainline operations and what the possibilities might be for, for use of ATO and better regulation um, and energy saving on main lines, but um, it, it proved to be very interesting because although the fundamental problem is, is perhaps different, as David suggested, between a main line operator and, and a, an inner city urban operator, I guess that urban operators, as, as Eddie was saying, in some of the outer areas, you're more akin to a timetabled service um, where on the metropolitan line or something in rural Buckinghamshire, you, you, you want to turn up at a given time and get a train each the same time each day. Um, so I think there is just a, um, a sort of a range of, of problems that, that you have to address, and the, the, the inner city metro operations are up at one end of a spectrum, and the, the, the mixed traffic main line networks are at the other end of a spectrum, but there's a lot of railways that are... In, in between there somewhere and, and where there's a lot of commonality of, uh, of approaches that can be used. And, and um, as I say, I think main lines in the coming years will realize that there are benefits to things that metros now understand the benefits of, like uh, automation and, and better regulation facilities. 
And equally, it may be, and it's perhaps not for me to say, coming from a sort of mainline background, that, that metros will find lessons to, from, the, from the mainline field, although not quite so clear where that might be at this instant. But, but I'm sure that will come. So, Eddie. So, are we, are we instead of labelling um, you know, the, the different signalling systems by title, are we seeing a convergence of toolboxes? You know, toolboxes of the equipment, toolboxes for implementation, toolboxes for operating. Um, and by doing a pick and mix of things that you can pick and mix, is that where we're seeing convergence? It's not necessarily necessary to give it a title. Um, I think Bob coined an expression when we were doing the earlier work that you know the, the, the operations should be oblivious to the signaling system below it. It should just get the best value to meet the business objectives. So what, what would that sort of look like and what, how would people get to that toolbox? Yes, I think that is the, the vital thing, that the more that one sees progression now, there's a, a systems thinking, shall we say, coming in. And the railway is a system. Providing the tools to support that system actually comes to the same thing. You need to provide information, real-time information. You need to provide the backup, the logging, etc., that goes with it. You need to have the simulation tools, the testing tools. And all of that is producing a mindset, and I'm beginning to see a change in the mindsets. So, in fact, at one time, the, the little railways, you know, the tramways of, uh, that the I grew up in, regarded mainline railways as something quite alien, uh, quite different, and let's keep ourselves as far away from that as possible because we'll get tainted by what they do. And exactly the same thinking was going on on the national railways, that you know, we've, we're the big railway, we know what we're doing, and uh, let's not get too involved in what's happening elsewhere. That has changed. There is no doubt that that has changed. Um, and so I am beginning now to see, not just in Europe, but perhaps led most in the Far East, that there is this thinking that, no, it is all one system. We all have a common problem. Let's have as many common solutions as possible. But I, I have to admit, I get a bit nervous when people talk about a CBTC standard. Because I think if we try to go down that route, exactly who is going to be part of it. A European standard wouldn't make sense. A North American standard is impossible, from my experience so far. So what's the point? It's much better to actually use the joint technology and the joint developments rather than try and dictate something. And I think that move is already happening. So, I think one more question from me, and then we'll open it up to the floor. And if nobody comes from the floor, we'll open up the bar. <laughs> um, well, I suppose I've got two questions. Um, you, you threw me a bit, Eddie, because you said you shouldn't end up with a specification for CBTC. Because uh, the next question was, actually, how do you get to a specification for CBTC? Um, more, more, how, how do we... Um, if it's not a specification, if it's a toolkit, if it's um, a blueprint to say what good looks like, whether it be evaluating your initial business case, whether it be choosing your product, implementation, or the whole life ownership, um, it seems that we, we, as a group of railway operators and professionals, we go from project to project, always doing a, a too much relearning. So it may not be a, a technical specification we're looking for, but uh, the manual of what good looks like, um, and that seems to be missing. Um, even at the thinking we see now with standards or specifications for CBTC, for example, it doesn't say how to do a good CBTC implementation. So how, how would we start to address that? Uh, ooh, ooh, I think it's going to stick with you, Eddie. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, you fooled me. You, you, you've, I, I actually agree with you that, um, yes, there does have to be that incentive and I seem to remember right at the beginning of VRTMS and ETCS the driver was it's going to be cheaper kit at least that's what we were being told at the time um, and surely underneath it all that is going to be at the end of the day what drives it all so if not just the kit but the uh, supporting uh, provisions are all there 
And if it is actually going to be cheaper to go down that route, that is what will happen. So I'm afraid, uh, you know, I come back to the dear old market philosophy that at the end of the day, if this is the right solution, it should emerge. I believe that operators can do their best to collaborate, and that is happening already. And, you know, even RATP and London Underground talk to each other, believe it or not. Um, so there is a move by the operators to try and combine. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all going to be a waste of time if the supply side isn't actually demonstrating that there's a benefit in it. So I think the pressure to uh, come up with a common standard will be there. The incentives are there because the more kit and the more development you can use in different applications, the better. So what will actually prevent it? Um, yeah, ju just to add to that, really, I mean, I, I have to be careful not to uh, use any sp specific examples of this, but I'm aware um, of a number of um, projects around the world which have looked at um, the inner sort of city areas w which are connected to mainline networks. Um, and usually there is a, at the moment, there is a, um, a debate that goes on about whether to use CBTC or whether to use ERTMS. Um, and I'm aware of several cases where um, the, it's been decided eventually that, that although ERTMS on paper seems to, seems to be a possibility, that they've chosen CBTC because um, they know they can implement that in a time scale and to a cost and, and with you know, some of the things we were hearing about earlier this afternoon, whereas um, ERTMS is only on the threshold of that at the moment, and, um, but because of the, the cost pressure on, on mainline operators um, and the, the pressure to deliver new schemes and to de deliver schemes faster, um, that balance will gradually shift, and in a few years' time, when somebody is looking at a project like that, um, they will weigh up the, the relative merits of the two types of solution and suddenly will say, actually, ERTMS would be a good way of doing this, um, you know, and, and giving some advantages in terms of not dual-fitting trains and that type of thing. Um, now, you know, just when we get to that point, I'm not going to speculate about, um, but um, as I say, I've seen a number of examples where that has been a consideration up to now. Um, and I think, um, you know, when um, ERTMS cab signaling and preferably level three is the day job for uh, mainline signaling people and suppliers and, and so on, then, um, then it will suddenly become a much more equal comparison that has to be made. And in some cases, the, the decision that comes out of that may be a different one to what would have been made a few years previously. So I don't know if that is a useful comment. Yeah, you can. I'll just add a little thing there. Um, I've been really struck by um, the, the talk about reliability, availability, um, robust products, the move of technology. And of course, if you look at the market that we, um, that we meet, it's a really small market. You know, you compare the number of phones in the world against the number of trains in the world, it's absolutely no comparison. So how do you read across all those big technology leaps and so on into what is, a, at the end of the day, a very bespoke market? You know, how many RBCs are there in the world? There might be quite a few trains fitted for ERTMS, but there's not that many block processors. So um, I, I think that's where one of the pressures comes, really, that if you can converge, then you start to get um, some of this focus of technology and to get that last five percent of availability i think you'll probably have to do it you know at the moment we can't keep going with bespoke solutions everywhere there will be a market pressure i'm sure i think that's an excellent point andy because it tees me up for the next question i'm going to be greedy and then i will open up to the floor um Metros have more flexibility to buy what they want. Um, and in a way, they could start the, um, walking down the path of establishing this blueprint, a holistic blueprint, a whole life, whole system implementation blueprint, 
And if that was the case, that you know there was only there was only one right way or best way to do things, then clearly then other operators, whether it be Metro or Mainline, would have a starting point by which to um, establish the, 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 the genesis of best practice in their own organisations. And, you know, if it become a groundswell, I think as you uh, pointed out, that Andy, that, you know, it become a more of an equipment standard by modules even, then we will get reliability because we'll get volume. But where's the controlling mind that does that? Oh, I think I'll give that one to you, George. I think, um, I mean, in terms of the way that we, the, the way that we have enjoyed that flexibility uh, over time is a challenge going forward. It is something that we still demand of the market. Um, we don't personally experience of a number of different administrations um, in major cities that have attempted to um, create a, an approach that will give them uh, the opportunity to, to benefit from uh, a wider supply base with common arrangements. Uh, and they've all s struggled with that approach uh, to try and influence it. Um, so it is something bigger than just one administration, no matter how big that administration is. Um, I think also that, that we see, um, without influencing it um, in a big way, we are also ourselves also constrained by European uh, regulations in terms of competitive tendering of works and so on and so forth. So um, we need to provide a, a, a requirement set that goes out there that does entertain a greater range of, of potential solutions, but within a framework that allows that to happen. So it is a bit of a balance in terms of how you take that forward. I don't think there is one controlling mind. I think there is a, 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 an arrangement where a, a set of requirements across a number of administrations can if you like, guide a, a, a path through this. Um, but it is very much still a scenario where we are expecting to get the flexibility we've always enjoyed. And so it's going to be quite a challenge uh, for people to, to recognise that that happens. Um, and it's back to what Bob was saying, the tilting point has to be when that suddenly you get to a scenario where the costs are at a situation where the, the confidence in that solution is at a level that says that now you can consider either whilst we have solutions out there and they've been out there for, for many years, it's very, very difficult to see how people will take that leap of faith at this point in time. And, and, and just a question in, relation, in response to your question. Whilst ETCS um, has taken some time to develop a specification because of the committee nature of it, at least now they're... Is that telling us we should stop? Immediately, I should stop. There is a there is a specification, a common specification everyone can work to. Is the, the question is there are there grounds for involving metro operators in the development of a new standard for communication-based train control, of which ETCS is part of the family, actually. So, is there a case that if we do move that way? And obviously, there are some downsides in terms of the amount of effort and getting getting uh, uh, agreement. At some point, there would be at least perhaps agreement on fundamental functions, and and as Tony has said, perhaps on an application manual that is common. So, is there are there grounds for going along a similar route to the ERTMS specification? I don't know. <laughs> Um, well, Andy can have his say in a moment, but um, I mean, I think I think from the Andy and I being suppliers, um, I think from our point of view, the what we are interested in is standardising products and and having common um, development threads that that are used as widely as possible, because that, as as Andy said, that's the way we get performance built into systems. Um, I mean, th at the end of the day, the choice is up to the the customer organisations, the railway authorities, the metro authorities, if, if they want a degree of standardisation, then it's in their power to, to, to work towards it in, in some way. We, we, we as suppliers would be happy if standards emerged um, because it means that we have a bigger supply base, customer base, 
that we can address in the future. Um, but equally, um, the sort of agile projects where we need to implement things very quickly and perhaps in, in other parts of the world mean that the flexibility to do that without too many constraints is also important in, in some areas. So I don't think there's any one answer to it. But do you want yeah, to have a go? Okay. <laughs> I'll have a go. Um, the only thing um, that is uh, interesting about standards is that uh, they kind of uh, give people a shortcut to an implementation. So y you imagine the amount of money that must have been spent producing the ETCS standards. Well, um, if you're in Australia, um, Southeast Asia, you might want to say, well, I'll just take that, thank you very much. You know, somebody else has done the hard work. Um, so that, you know, that, that could be a very important um, sort of benefit there. What you don't want to do is to stultify things and um, you still need to get, keep that flexibility for innovation. Um, one other benefit of standards could be um, interoperability from the point of view of being able to split your system up. So um, say you could standardize the air interface, that might give you more flexibility in contracting so that you could um, sort of uh, go out to the market for train supply and track side in separate contracts. Um, it might even mean that you could do those on different time frames. So you don't have to, I mean with CBTC systems today, you tend to be totally locked in right from the train all the way up to the control system and buy the whole thing in one go and then it all wears out at different rates. So perhaps um, uh, standardizing in specific places like the air interface would give quite a lot of opportunity to decouple those um, you know, procurement boundaries. Do you disagree, or do you want to say something, Eddie? No, I was agreeing. All right, excellent. <laughs> right, as, as promised, is there any questions? Thank you. Jean-Paul Murat, Siemens. W one question to the, pan to the panel and uh, back to, to the last uh, comment. Uh, I mean, you mentioned that RETP has, uh, has implemented such a system uh, in Paris, uh, an interoperable system, interchangeable, actually. And we see on the market that there has been little resonance to, to this achievement. Uh, I, I just remind that the Line 3 has been in operation for one year now in Paris with an interchangeable system. Uh, so do you think that the market or that the need will be towards a uh, ETCS-based CBTC that would be interchangeable? Or do you think that it's just the fact that the, that the, the metros need a, uh, an ETCS system that is capable to deliver performances in the inner city? The, um, yeah, the performance issue seems to be going away. Um, the, you know, you're getting platforms now that have got the hardware capability. Um, perhaps we need to look at the air interface, but I don't think there's a fundamental performance issue. So, so yeah, the interoperability um, at the air interface would give you that separation. Um, what do you call it? I mean, it, it's a mix, isn't it, really? So it, it doesn't have to be one system winning. But um, because ETCS has set out the air interface and so on, you get an awful lot of things worked out for you. So we were talking about the dwell time with ATO or, um, you know, the um, automatic train regulation where you're giving drain, uh, trains waypoints for driver advisory systems and so on. All that is being standardized in the, um, the packet 44 definitions for, for national operations. So, you know, say Thameslink, well, Thameslink will come up, for example, with a number of interfaces which can be adopted across the UK straight away. So it's that kind of model. If somebody actually puts the trouble into defining some of these interfaces, then it, I, I think that's where it may become a self-defining standard, yeah. It's a very interesting question, and uh, I, I have to say I've just come back from New York, um, and obviously there is there was a strong move there towards producing a standard, which I think the uh, intention was that that could become an international standard. Um, and obviously the, the, the Paris solution is a very similar one, shall we say. Um, you do... I think then come back to what is it that drives people to specify systems. And perhaps there is a tendency 
to specify the solution rather than to actually specify the need to solve a problem. And that's my slight reluctance in terms of saying, well, we should have a standard. Because to make that standard suit all of the requirements, it can become completely unwieldy. It has to incorporate so many different things that it becomes very difficult to actually uh, provide, but even more difficult to demonstrate you've met the standard. And therefore, it ossifies. And I think the thing we've seen is that technology is moving so fast that you really do not want to have a standard that causes you to have to use obsolete technology to solve the problem. And that's the trend that I'm beginning to see. Um, hopefully, the ERTMS world will be able to move as things change. But there is a danger of specifying too low down in the system and then really freezing development. And that can't be the right solution. I would like to ask, or put, uh, rephrase a question that's probably, probably been asked. Uh, firstly, I'd like to couch it in the, uh, in the terms of how do you eat an elephant? And we all know we have a lot of trouble, <laughs> or a slice at a time. It's already been stated that uh, by the equipment manufacturers that the wayside for CBTC and ETCS are the same. You know, you could almost define a modular standard for that. And hopefully that then generates volume in the market, which ends up in more reliable products and lower costs. So rather than try and do a big bang approach and start investigating the specifications, maybe it's about defining the modules, those which need to be specified, those that can be specified now, those that can be in time. And there are probably some things that you just want to specify an interface and not the solution because the technology moves too quick. So I go back to who's the controlling mind because there is cost down pressure, there is performance pressure. We know it's there, but we don't seem to be um, seeing what we've articulated today manifest itself in an organisational or responsible body trying to sort of navigate everybody through that minefield. Uh, it, needs, it needs a leader, um, whether it be the first to market. You know, we've seen it with Oregon, I suppose, in, in Paris and maybe in um, Kanazi. Um, but we talked about, well, George mentioned, um, you know, that uh, administrations change. Well, Europe is the, the EU... Uh, Unisig is, is sort of seeing several institutions come and go, or administrations go, come and go. So maybe that is a vehicle that we could modify. Um, but it's how, how do we take that forwards as you know, railway professionals, and I mean the operators and the suppliers, because you know, the, they are, the suppliers are responding, I believe, but they need to work in a framework uh, uh, w which enables the industry to move forward together uh, with a game plan. <laughs> 